Good afternoon. It's 12.30. I know um, it's a big vacation week, but we do want to start exactly on time, as that is one of our missions here at uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, thanks for joining us. Today we are um, privileged to have Dr. Sheila Partridge and Dr. Susie Wishnia to talk to us about updates in bariatric surgery. Um, thanks for joining us for our Lunch and Learn. Please feel free um, to uh, write any questions in the chat box. We'll try to get them at the end. Um, as you know, we uh, were able to wrangle a CME credit for these talks, and here's the code Z-O-X-M-E-Y. I will put that in the chat box. Um, and if you have any questions about getting that um, code afterwards, you can just let us know. Teasing next week, so I'm really excited about next week's talk. Dr. Kim Parks is going to be talking about lifestyle medicine, an evidence-based approach to COVID-19 prophylaxis with a question mark. Should be an exciting talk. Again, CME credits will be available. Um, also, I want folks to know that we did um, rejigger how we store the uh, previous talks, and you can go to YouTube and just search for Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn, and you should be able to get, we have a whole channel with all the talks set up. And also, if you get this slide set, these links are live, and you can go right to the YouTube um, talks as well. And with that, I'm going to unshare my screen and allow Drs. Partridge and Wishnia um, to uh, take over at this point. Let's see. Go ahead, Susie. You should be able to grab the screen now. OK. Um, hmm. Let me just. Looks good. That looks yeah. good. That's your screen, right? Oh, yeah. There we go. I wasn't um, toggling for a minute, but now it's working. Great. So I'd like to just say thank you for having us um, and be able to, to speak to you all today. Um, we want to make it relatively informal and let you ask questions and certainly we'll save time at the end. Um, Susie and I wanted to really introduce you to or help you dem help demonstrate how we treat patients, our team approach to treating the disease of obesity um, and how we like to treat the whole patient because obesity is a very multifactorial, multifaceted disease. So our main goal is to help PCPs and specialists and others throughout the um, Newton Wellesley community really how to help people live longer, happier, and healthier lives. That's really our main objective. So now more than ever during the COVID pandemic, it's not 10, 15 years in the future that you're trading off some hard work now for benefit down, down the road. It's, it's very upfront and, and close and personal seeing that obesity is one of the major risk factors for severe COVID um, disease, second to only age over 70. So I think it's, um, it's quite uh, timely um, that we reintroduce and rediscuss why it's important to treat obesity, how it's not a lifestyle choice. And I'm gonna ask, um, so maybe next slide, I guess. I'll, I'll introduce you to a few, our team, and then um, Susie will talk to you some, and we'll go back and forth and, and answer questions for sure. Um, we have a, 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 a big program here in um, two surgeons, obviously, but um, we have a lot of staff, nur nurses who assist us. Renee Wade is our coordinator, and Sally and Doris um, are, are vital members of the team. We have folks that do psychological assessment because, again, this is multifaceted disease is unlike any other surgery where you need a psychological evaluation prior to having this surgery and making this big lifestyle change. We work with dietitians, um, both in the, our center and in the hospital, and then we have a great front desk administration team. Um, and really exciting, and, and it was something we've worked on for many, many years, is the addition of a medical obesity specialist to our team and that component to help treat our patients throughout the hospital, whether it be George Philippides from cardiovascular um, cardiology or um, Gene Steppel Resnick and Slovic and those folks from endocrine, they want somebody to help treat the disease of obesity within their specialties, whether it be AFib or be diabetes, that they see these patients, we, they really are clamoring for this and so are we, our patients both before, if they don't qualify for surgery, um, it's kind of hard to send your patients to a surgeon sometimes and say, and, and really do that sort of lift to, to explain it. And that's not what we want you to have to do. We want to help you know that we're here, but we also want to have a medical specialist. And so we've hired Chika Anekwe 
and um, she is starting October 1st. It can't come soon enough. I'm very exciting. We've all interviewed her and throughout the hospital. Very, very exciting news. Her um, director, associate director at the MGH Weight Center for the medical obesity component is Dr. Fitch, Angela Fitch. And Angela will also be here probably about 20% of the time to help the program get up and running because she's done an amazing job downtown. And they have sites at Danvers and Mass General West. And um, we have really wanted to collaborate with them and do collaborate with them on the quality and partners level um, for many years now. And now is in 2020, you know, some good things, but um, we are gonna actually establish a, um, a, our full multidisciplinary clinic. So I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about that. So from here, I think, next slide. Um, I'll have, Susie will um, start to talk to you about the disease of obesity and why it's important to treat. All right, well, thank you. Um, I also, um, you know, uh, agree with Sheila and all the points and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. So the disease of obesity, um, over one third of the American population is obese, which really equates to about 80 million um, Americans are obese patients. Of people in the United States. And even in Massachusetts, you know, we think of our state as one of the healthier states, but even here, we have a population of about 25 to 30 percent of people that are obese. So significant even in our own healthier state. So what is obesity? Well, obesity is a metabolic disease. Um, it's a medical diagnosis that is a lifelong, life-threatening progressive disease. Um, it usually affects the quality of life, makes other medical conditions more complicated and can kill people before their time. Um, in addition, it's costly to the individual and society. These are statistics from 2007, but it showed that um, someone who is obese compared to a normal weight person probably spends about $1,400, $1,500 extra in their health care per year. And those statistics probably have only um, increased as time has gone on. Obesity, like any other chronic disease, um, shouldn't be ignored. Um, I've highlighted here the way that um, we kind of calculated or how we stratify obesity, which is measured uh, in weight in kilograms over height in meters squared. And, um, you know, at some point, how did we evolve from this um, in, into this? Somewhere along the way, uh, our genetics, environment, stressors, and other agents have really changed our hormonal signals to give us different set points for our bodies, um, which has led to an obese or overweight population. So why is it so hard to lose weight? Um, it, it's this idea of a set point, um, a regulation system which it, within people's metabolism, and it, it works to keep their ability to keep their weight at a certain level. Um, there's very kind of difficult, it's multifaceted, and there can be different mechanisms um, where the old energy equation, where your energy in or your calories in were equilibrated by your ed energy expenditure um, goes by the wayside. You know, I have, uh, Sheila and I both have patients who joke that, um, you know, they have friends that can eat a whole loaf of bread and not gain any weight, and they have the same activity level that the patient who's talking does, and the other patient looks at a piece of bread and gains weight. So, um, you know, it's this idea that somewhere along the way our, our bodies have set higher set points, and um, we need to figure out how to lower the, the set point. As far as a patient's report, um, you know, they feel like they have a decision to lose weight, they work really hard, they're determined to make changes, they want to join a gym, they decide to cut back on food, you know, initially success comes relatively easily, you get cheered on by your friends, you look better, you feel really happy, there's positive reinforcement, but at some point the progress slows. The weight, you know, the work is harder, you exercise more, and you don't really see the same results. Um, and if it was just about what you eat, then why would you hit a brick wall? And this is what our patients talk about all the time, that after a while, you know, it can be five pounds for some patients, it can be 10 pounds, it can be 50 pounds for some patients who are still morbidly obese. And they hit a wall where the weight just doesn't come off. They keep doing the same thing that had created weight loss in the past, healthy habits, exercise, and they just can't get more weight off despite their goals. So that leads to frustration. 
it um, leads to kind of falling off the wagon for some of your habits. Um, patients feel more tired, um, they get less motivated, and then the weight starts to gain back. So why does this happen? Well, there, it's a very uh, multifactorial process. Um, you know, it can be somewhat to the processed diets, to e irregular eating patterns. Um, some of the dieting fads out there have people um, skipping meals or, uh, you know, not eating the uh, proper foods. Um, skipping meals tells the body's metabolism to slow down because fuel is not coming into the system. So if people skip, you know, for example, breakfast and lunch in order to reduce their calorie consumption, that could send the wrong signals to the body to slow down the metabolism and actually uh, have higher risk for increasing your set point. Inadequate physical activity, let's face it, as the American society just gets more stressed and now with the COVID pandemic, we're all sitting in front of the computer all day long. Mm -hmm. So um, we do get a lot less physical activity. Inadequate sleep can lead to poor weight loss. For example, even untreated um, obstructive sleep apnea. If you're having lower oxygen levels at night, um, you know, you feel fatigued when you wake up in the morning and you only want to eat more to try to increase your energy. Um, stress, medications that cause weight gain, and then our general changes that we see in life with aging, pregnancy, and menopause. In addition, um, I think emotional eating has gotten to be a huge problem in the U.S. and maybe the poor management of our, of our stress and, and dealing with our emotions. Um, there are great impacts, uh, especially, especially physiological impacts of obesity. Um, it's not just about cosmesis or the weight itself. Um, there are about 195 different diseases that can be either directly attributed or made worse by obesity. Um, some of the top 18 or 20 are, are up on the screen. And the higher the BMI, the higher the health risks um, with that. And uh, in addition, there's this uh, um, twin epidemic of obesity and diabetes um, that we have coined the term diabetes. Whereas nearly 90% of people living with type 2 diabetes also have a diagnosis of being overweight or obese. In addition, the risk of the development of diabetes is almost 20 times higher if a person has a BMI of greater than 35 or higher. Um, prior to the COVID epidemic, um, diabetes was the leading cause of preventable disease in the United States, uh, surpassing tobacco, um, bumping tobacco down uh, to spot number two. So what is the treatment? Well, the most successful treatment is metabolic surgery. And um, I think when people hear that, they feel, you know, maybe it's too radical or, um, you know, how can surgery be the best treatment option? And so kind of a, a poll for the audience, uh, once you've reached a certain set point, which uh, we'll coin here as a BMI greater than 35, what does the audience feel that the success rate for treating obesity with diet and exercise alone? Because that's what normally we would recommend is the first baseline, you know, treatment process. Any takers? All right, well, I'll tell you, it's 1%. So 1% of the population has the ability to um, change their morbid obesity or um, bring themselves down to even an obese level um, with diet and exercise alone. And for a BMI of greater than 40, that statistics is one in 2000. So um, if the set point is not changed um, and you only get, this leads to only getting short-term weight loss. And this happens with a lot of dieting is where people can make tweaks in their diet, they can exercise, they can improve habits, and they can lower their weight uh, to a certain extent. However, if the set point itself is not lowered, then patients usually don't see sustained weight loss long-term. So how do we change the, the set point? Well, the set point can be changed with medications um, and it can be changed with uh, surgery is another option. The issue with lifestyle and dietary modification is that rarely it changes the body set point significantly enough to maintain it at a lower, healthier level. And um, that's what can happen with some of the fad diets and why the statistics are as such that once you get to a BMI of 35, you have about a 1% chance of uh, reaching a healthy weight on your own. 
Medications also lower um, the, the body set point. They can reduce hunger cravings. They can increase metabolism. But the negative aspect of medications is they can be costly. And once you're on them, you usually have to stay on them for life to create that lower set point and sustain it long term. The other option, especially once people reach a BMI of 35 or 40, is with surgery. It's um, the best uh, adapter or changing uh, method to change your metabolism. And um, so I'll go into the kind of surgeries that we do offer here um, at our Center for General Weight Loss Surgery. Um, there have been, uh, as part of the talk, it's updates in, in bariatric surgery. There have been many changes over the last um, 10 years. And if you look at the statistics for 2011, we were mainly doing the Roux and Y gastric bypass. About 40% of the procedures were bypass. Another 30 to 40 were the band. Um, less uh, favorable was the newer sleeve gastrectomy. I think in Massachusetts, um, most of the big top tier insurances started letting us do them in 2010 um, across the board. Um, and, you know, small percentage of revision surgery. Fast forward to 2017, where the sleeve has become the primary um, procedure that we do for weight loss. Um, a large aspect of it is the safer, um, the safety profile is, is better. Um, patients tolerate it better in the sense that they feel that there's less risks involved. Um, you can have any medication you want, so that's a big um, take home point for the sleeve gastrectomy as compared to the gastric bypass. Um, patients can have NSAIDs, ibuprofens, Advils, aspirins, and not have the adverse effects of uh, marginal ulcer that they did with the gastric bypass. In addition, we see that the band has fallen significantly out of favor, and this goes along with the fact that the band is not a metabolic procedure. It's a restriction-only procedure, which does not really change your set point and, and tries to modify people's dietary intake. And then finally, um, our revision procedures, a lot of band removals, um, some conversions of band to sleeve, and even additional or, or staged uh, other metabolic procedures, which we'll talk about, have uh, come into place. Um, do you want me to, Sheila, do you want to talk about this? Sure, case? sure. So the sleeve gastrectomy, as, as um, Susie was saying, is, um, is it's become a standalone operation. It was originally the first part of a two-stage operation, but it showed that it had such good weight loss, um, and it has evolved over the past um, several decades to become a standalone operation that has a significant metabolic change. It's not just restrictive. Um, and we have great data from the last 10 to 15 years that show that the patients have very similar outcomes to the gastric bypass, which we did for years and years, but they don't have the same risk of ulcers, as she mentioned, and then internal hernias with the bowel. If you're rearranging the small bowel, anytime you cut or reconnect the small bowel, you have a chance for internal hernia, you have a chance for bowel obstruction. So this is a much lower um, long-term risk operation. Plus it doesn't reroute the intestines. So patients who had Crohn's disease or those who had multiple um, other procedures and couldn't use their small bowel at, for a bypass are, can still have a metabolic operation. They are not relegated to just the, the band, which we never did here because it wasn't a me metabolic operation. Now fast forward to the second part of this two-stage operation is the duodenal switch, which is the super metabolic operation that is the most extreme. And it's done about 1%. I think your data showed maybe up to 2% in the country. Um, and it's only done in specialized centers um, because of the severity of this um, option. However, with the more and more people having sleeve gastrectomy and weight and obesity being a chronic progressive disease, um, people need a next step. So the second stage, if you start with a BMI in a very high category over 50 or severe type 2 diabetes, the next metabolic step is an intestinal rearrangement to the end of your intestine. About 300 centimeters is the common channel that you see there pointed out. Thanks. And um, this is an operation that we've been doing for the past about three years because many of our patients start with a BMI in the 50s. We have about a quarter of our patients who are diabetic. And when they come in asking for a sleeve, we don't want them to feel like a failure. We tell them, you will have a response to the sleeve. You may be a super responder, 
but it's a bell-shaped curve. And you may, despite a good operation and the best of lifestyle and behavior management and even medications, many of them are on, um, you may not have the response to surgery that you desire um, and may need to take this next step. The ruin y gastric bypass had been the gold standard for years and years. We had dealt with dehydration and ulcers and internal hernias, but that's, we talk about the, our pain points and the problems that our patients come back with, of course, because we are working to make the least complicated, most effective operation that ties the patient to the hospital the least. And the bypass has panned out to be very good for someone who has severe reflux, but a better operation is the sleeve gastrectomy, and we are doing more and more of that. If they need the next step, the next step is not to bypass a sleeve, it is to do a duodenal switch to a sleeve. And with the advent of robotic technology, um, you know, I said last night, we, Susie and I were talking about this, and I said, who wouldn't want computer enhanced um, technology to help you operate? Um, so you can look at this as the surgeon does the operation, and the surgeon is the woman sitting at the console there, um, and their assistant is, um, loading the instruments at the bedside after you've already docked and, and started the procedure like you would any laparoscopic surgery. However, you sit down and you see the computer enhancement. I'm about to go down and take a gallbladder out this way, and the computer enhancement will show me the bile duct because I'm injecting this patient with endocyanine green. And so all these new technologies and, and val the value added is um, it doesn't slow us down much. It's not that much more expensive when you look at all the value added. Um, and it is right now when we are in our sort of early phase of this, introducing it to the hospital in 2018 with colorectal and then adding on GYN and whatnot, but focusing all here on the bariatrics, it really has helped us do advanced revisional surgery and to do the duodenal switch and um, patients are doing beautifully. Um, and I think it's a technology that's not only um, here to stay, but will be um, standard of care in the not too distant future. You can do the next slide. Um, so you want to talk about outcomes and things? Sure. So um, what do we expect to um, have our patients lose? Well, uh, for the gastric bypass, it's somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of their excess weight. Similarly, the sleeve gastrectomy is about 60 to 70 percent of the excess weight as well. You may get, you know, about 10 percent extra from the malabsorption that the gastric bypass gives that the sleeve doesn't. But if you talk to most patients, it's somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 pounds, and they don't want the added risk uh, for that. Um, and then finally, you know, um, we used to have this point in the slide called failure rate. And it's actually, um, you know, in thinking about it in a different manner, it's really a poor response rate. Sheila um, had talked about the bell-shaped curve of any treatment process where you have super responders and you have people that don't respond so well. And that's, I think, where this 5% um, mark of, of less desirable response is. But, but now with the advent of the duodenal switch, we have the next step to offer our patients. And some patients do great with weight loss, and they may be at a BMI that is acceptable to them, but they still have really bad diabetes, and at least we can offer the duodenal switch for them. And the increased life expectancy is, um, is really extraordinary. 70 years on average for patients uh, that start out with a BMI of 40, um, and, and undergo surgery, and then 14 years for patients who start out with a BMI of 55. Um, other weight loss outcomes, diabetes-related mortality is reduced by over 90%. Cancer-related mortality reduced by 60%. You know, some of our patients haven't gone to see their gynecologist in 10 to 15 years because they're embarrassed or worried about the care that they're gonna receive. And so we get them back involved in routine healthcare and screening. Um, and in addition, with the decreased estrogen production and some of the other things that go along with, with uh, weight loss, we see a significant reduction in mortality related to cancer and also coronary artery disease reduced by over 50%. Um, you know, here on, on the slide are, are other positive benefits in cardiovascular mortality, but what really is significant is by operating on, you know, 13 patients, one out of every 13 can be saved. Um, with, with uh, weight loss surgery. And then finally, to wrap it up so I give enough time for questions, um, our center has really looked um, in the last few years to, to provide added support for our patients. 
We have a Berrytastic app, which patients can log their food. They can stay routinely in touch with our dietitians. Um, updates can be pushed to them on their phone for group support meetings. Um, we have a new My Hungry Head program, which adds cognitive behavioral therapy and addresses the emotional eating issues that I, that I had talked about earlier. And finally, we're proud to offer virtual visits and direct from our website. Um, patients can choose to watch the new patient seminar online. They don't have to drive in and they can also have uh, virtual visits and have easy access to us. And, um, and that's really the end. I wanna leave some time for questions. Susie, thanks. Uh, Sheila, thank you so much. Um, yeah. You can um, stop sharing. I will put the uh, code back in the um, in the chat room. Um, if there's any questions, I've muted everyone, so you're welcome to shout out. If you're on a cell phone, you have to hit star six. Um, in the chat room, there is one question. I'll put it out for you guys. What annual labs do you recommend after sleep gastrectomy for monitoring nutrition, uh, nutrition, vitamin, and minerals? Yeah, so we have a whole panel that we, um, we include more for the duodenal switch because there's more of a malabsorptive component for that. Um, but in general, um, I have a dot phrase, I can put it out, but it basically is um, the ones that aren't obvious, parathyroid hormone. Um, we check iron storage um, and, and um, multiple vitamin levels like B vitamins. Um, for the DS, uh, we, we, the duodenal switch, we check vitamins A, D, E, K, magnesium, manganese, selenium, zinc, a lot of uh, the minerals that aren't normally checked on a routine panel. Um, we check thyroid, we check hemoglobin A1C, even if diabetes has been resolved because it is a lifelong progressive disease. And just like obesity has a spectrum, diabetes has a spectrum. So they're a twin epidemic. So we really are vigilant about following our diabetic patients and our patients in general to make sure that they're not being missed and that you know, um, there are many, many patients that come in and they have an A1C that um, they, they say it, it's, it's eight or nine and they say they're borderline diabetes. Um, and so we say, no, you're actually, you're severe diabetes. And, you know, um, so it, there are a lot of labs that we need to check lifelong. And, and certainly if patients are following up with their primary care only, um, which is is okay. We don't. We encourage you to encourage them to partake of all of the support, the lifestyle support, the nutrition support. So in which case we would see them once a year. And I joke. I say whether you like us or not, come in once a year. We'll check your labs. If you move away, we 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 do a you know a, a these are the labs that we check. Um, and uh, what about uh, this question, Sheila? Are, are you still holding the information sessions that you used to hold in? in the large auditorium? Are you doing those virtual or are people just doing individual ones? So we have the virtual, um, it's a pre-recorded one. We are going to update it and we were hoping to, um, to make that a new presentation when we have our full complement of staff and have it be with Dr. Inekwe and uh, Dr. Wishney right. and myself and the other staff. So I think more to come on that for sure. Right. It's an exciting time. And then Cord is asking, um, as he always does, do we know how many patients among our PHO the covered lives that we cover have a BMI over 35. Is there, and of the, how many of those are appropriate for bariatric services? Yeah, so in, nationally, we operate on only 1% of the population that would qualify for bariatric surgery. And in, um, I just read yesterday regarding the COVID pandemic that about 9% of the population in the country have um, severe obesity and are at risk for severe COVID, but they reduced that number from BMI of 40 down to BMI of 30. So that's actually more like 45% of our country, our population. So wow. if you look, then look into our Mass General Brigham community, which we have done as a quality um, improvement project, um, it is a, maybe a slightly lower percent, maybe less than 30, and certainly consistent with the Massachusetts data of 25 to 30% of a BMI of 30 that Susie showed that map at the beginning. So our Mass General Brigham population is very similar to the rest of the state, and we are operating on, again, probably less than one to 2% of folks who would qualify. Um, and it's not to say anyone's doing a bad job, there's just a lot of education that needs to go on for patients, for staff, 
um, a lot of um, misconceptions that we're hoping to clear up even here today, some of them. Um, and a lot that evolves in that we're learning. So you saw that, that pyramid that uh, Susie had put up where it had surgery for the higher BMIs. Um, I think it is in the guidelines and it is becoming standard of care to at least offer it as an option to our patients who have a BMI 35 and above and they qualify for surgery. It doesn't mean everybody should have surgery. It just means that it's an option that they qualify for it and they should know that it exists. Thank you. Um, one quick, last quick question. It says, can anyone see this seminar? The seminar is off the website, so it's open and free, right? Uh, it the, is. Uh, um, you'll, if you contact our office, they'll give you the information to navigate through the link. We want to be able to have a touch point so we can explain to patients the process. Um, but yes, anyone can have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys very much. It's one o'clock. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you again. Um, everyone have a nice weekend and join us next week. I put the CME code in the chat box. Bye-bye. Great. You. That was great timing. <laughs> <laughs> one o'clock. It's like... <laughs>